This week, what Vatican traditions is Pope Francis changing? Who has a Vatican passport? And why are young people taking a shine to the Pope? Hello and welcome to another edition of Vatican Connections. We're getting close to the start of Lent and with that we always get messages and busy schedules. We're going to take a look at all of those coming up very shortly. But first, June 29th is always a big day in Rome. It's the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul and the day the Pope invests the pallium on new metropolitan bishops. Pope Francis is changing that practice now. New Metropolitan Bishops will be invited to come celebrate Mass with the Pope on that day, but they will receive their pallium at home from the hands of the Papal Nuncio at a date that allows the faithful of the local Archdiocese to participate. The announcement was made in a letter sent to Nuncios around the world. When she died in 2008, Chiara Lubick was hailed by Pope Benedict XVI as a woman of intrepid faith and a model of Christian love. This week, she is officially on the road to sainthood. Lubick founded the Focolare movement in 1944, and when she died in 2008, there were almost two million members of the movement. The Holy See has given its official approval to open a cause to have her recognized a saint. A formal ceremony was held in Frascati, Italy this week. A tribunal has been established to study her life and establish whether she lived a life of heroic Christian virtue. They will eventually submit their report to the Pope who will give his final approval. Some other sainthood causes moved ahead this past week as well. Pope Francis approved decrees about 11 potential saints. He recognized the martyrdom of three people, one of whom was killed in South Africa in the 1990s, and two who were killed in Spain during the Civil War in 1936. Pope Francis also recognized the heroic virtues of seven people, including an American-born priest, Aloysius Schwartz, who founded the World Villages for Children in Korea, as well as two religious communities, the Sisters of Mary and the Brothers of Christ. At the end of the Pope's recent trip to Sri Lanka and the Philippines, we learned that Pope Francis intends to visit Ecuador, Bolivia, and Paraguay. The Pope said these trips are still in the hypothetical rough draft stage, but the president of Bolivia has been making official sounding announcements about the Pope's itinerary. Now the bishops of Bolivia and even other South American politicians have made statements warning against instrumentalizing the Pope's intended visit for political purposes. The background is, the bishops and the Bolivian government have not had an easy relationship over the years, and Bolivia is currently in a legal dispute with Chile over a piece of coastline that it lost to Chile 125 years ago. All of this makes the potential papal visit very delicate, but nothing Pope Francis can't handle. It's that time of year again. Lent is fast approaching. The Vatican has released the Pope's message to the faithful for Lent and the Pope's liturgical schedule. The papal message for Lent is titled, Make Your Hearts Firm. In it, Pope Francis focuses more on the idea of the globalization of indifference, and he proposes three scripture passages to reflect on. Now, you can read the full text of the message on our blog. As for his Lent and Holy Week schedule, it's quite full. Ash Wednesday is February 18th, and Pope Francis will lead the traditional penitential procession. On March 13th, the Pope will lead a penitential service at St. Peter's. Now, you might remember last year, he stunned everyone by going to confession himself before hearing other people's confessions. Holy Week will be much the same. On Holy Thursday, Pope Francis will celebrate the Chrism Mass at St. Peter's and then celebrate the Mass of the Lord's Supper in private with a group of his choosing. Salt and Light will bring you full coverage of those liturgies. 
Divine Mercy Sunday is giving us a twist. The Pope will celebrate Mass for Armenian Rite Faithful, marking the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. Finally, an update on the sad story we mentioned last week. 27-year-old Crystal Padassas died after a mass celebrated by Pope Francis during his trip to the Philippines. She was buried this week in Manila. The papal nuncio to the Philippines read a message from Pope Francis at the funeral. Padassas was a Catholic Relief Services worker, and she volunteered to help out during the Pope's mass in Tacloban. A strong gust of wind knocked over a tower of scaffolding, fracturing her skull. Pope Francis met with Padassa's family before leaving the Philippines. Even some of the most unexpected groups of people have become fans of Pope Francis. They see him as a warm, lovable, approachable, and practical father figure they can relate to. But he's doing especially well with one very important demographic. Despite having just turned 78, he's a hit with the 20 and 30-somethings in the Catholic Church. CNS brings us a four-part series exploring this phenomenon. And here is part one of Young Catholics. that um, in, in society we have this idea of the, the Pope being kind of like an old person figure, like grandmas like love the Pope and that kind of thing. And I think Pope Francis um, is one of those people that is just like wants the youth to be a part of this system to really appreciate what the papacy has to offer um, and to show that it's something that is available to people of all ages and not just the old grandma living down the street. has made himself um, accessible to people and he really shows his um, genuine love for people and um, you know wants to level with them and be with them and really kind of um, live out Christ's example live out the faith and put it into practice you know in this generation People do. They take selfies everywhere. So what does the Pope do? He's gonna take a selfie with you. You know, like he's not like you know high and mighty. Like he's he's a normal person. And I think the whole selfie thing with the Pope is. I mean, of course, it's a little bit absurd, but it's fun and like you know, it's it's cool. The selfie is something that nowadays is becoming a huge trend. And by taking selfies, Pope Francis is showing, I am trying to communicate with you. I'm trying to use your channels of communications to reach you. And one of those channels of communication is a selfie. It somewhat is a, is a little bit of a sign of friendship, I guess. So that the Pope is allowing that to happen, I think is a good idea because it just approaches the young people kind of where they're at, what, they, what they'd like to do. I just think in previous years, the Catholic Church has kind of had this image of being closed off and being the Pope is obviously the highest position that you could have in the church and I think it was very much sort of like, I'm the Pope and you're the people and I think that this is a great thing for the church, for the Pope to be saying more of a message of, I'm one of you, I am just like you, I'm a follower of God, I'm a pilgrim. So friendly and so open and wanting to meet people and interact with everyone um, there's a lot of like fangirling I think everyone everyone really loves him not a lot of popes or presidents or big heads of states will take a selfie with people and the fact that Pope Francis does that shows how open he is to interacting with everybody and just showing his humanity I don't think that the being my buddy is relationship is, is harmful in itself, but I do think that uh, there should also be some kind of there should be a sign of respect also towards the Pope, as we would 
pay to any kind of religious or political leader. I mean, if you have a selfie with President Obama, it, we're not gonna we're not gonna think, oh, he's not the president. Like he's like my cool bro. But we're gonna we're gonna say, okay, he's the president. But I have I had that opportunity. I had that grace to take a selfie with him. Okay, so I think if these two are combined, then that's 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 fine. selfie is really popular with youth and young adults because it's a trend in normal society that's just kind of transposed onto the Holy Father. I think it's something that he probably doesn't like the attention being on himself but he recognizes it as a way to um, attract to the youth and, and to be really connected to them. So I think um, in his humility he realizes that's the way that he can reach out and show the love of Christ and so I think he utilizes that in a good way. Time to check out what the Pope's been doing this week. On Sunday, Pope Francis led a Vesper service to mark the end of the week of prayer for Christian unity. CNS has more. Tante controversie tra cristiani ereditati dal passato si possono superare mettendo da parte ogni atteggiamento polemico o apologetico e cercando insieme di cogliere in profondità ciò che ci unisce, e cioè la chiamata a partecipare al mistero dell'amore del Padre, rivelato a noi dal Figlio per mezzo dello Spirito Santo. L'unità dei cristiani, siamo convinti, non sarà il frutto di raffinate discussioni teoriche nelle quali ciascuno tenterà di convincere l'altro della fondatezza delle proprie opinioni. Verrà il figlio dell'uomo e ci troverà ancora nelle discussioni. Dobbiamo riconoscere che per giungere alla profondità del mistero di Dio abbiamo bisogno gli uni degli altri di incontrarci e di confrontarci sotto la guida dello Spirito Santo che armonizza le diversità e supera il conflitto, riconcilia le diversità. Nella chiamata ad essere evangelizzatori, Tutte le chiese e comunità ecclesiali trovano un ambito essenziale per una più stretta collaborazione. Per poter svolgere efficacemente tale compito, occorre evitare di chiudersi nei propri particolarismi ed esclusivismi, come pure di imporre uniformità secondo piani meramente umani. Il comune impegno ad annunciare il Vangelo permette di superare ogni forma di proselitismo e la tentazione di competizione. Siamo tutti al servizio dell'unico e medesimo Vangelo. In questo momento di preghiera per l'unità, Vorrei ricordare i nostri martiri di oggi. Loro danno testimonianza di Gesù Cristo e vengono perseguitati e uccisi perché cristiani, senza fare distinzione da parte dei persecutori della confessione alla quale appartengono. Sono cristiani e per questo perseguitati. Questo è, fratelli e sorelle, l'ecumenismo del sangue. On Monday, Pope Francis met with a delegation from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and Wednesday, of course, was the general audience. CNS brings us a look at this week's catechesis. Padre, 
è una parola nota a tutti, una parola universale. Essa indica una relazione fondamentale la cui realtà è antica quanto la storia dell'uomo. Oggi, tuttavia, si è arrivati ad affermare che la nostra sarebbe una società senza padre. In altri termini, in particolare nella cultura occidentale, la figura del padre sarebbe simbolicamente assente, svanita, rimossa. In un primo momento la cosa è stata percepita come una liberazione, liberazione dal padre padrone, dal padre come rappresentante della legge che si impone dall'esterno, dal padre come censore della felicità dei figli e ostacolo all'emancipazione e all'autonomia dei giovani. Ma talvolta in alcune casse regnava l'autoritarismo, in certi casi addirittura la, la sopraffazione, genitori che trattavano i figli come servi, non rispettando le esigenze personali della loro crescita. Padri che non li aiutavano a intraprendere la loro strada con libertà. Ma non è facile educare un figlio in libertà, eh? Padri che non li aiutavano ad assumere le proprie responsabilità per costruire il loro futuro e quello della società. Questo, certamente, è un atteggiamento non buono. Ma però, come spesso avviene, si passa da un estremo all'altro. Il problema dei nostri giorni non sembra essere più tanto la presenza invadente dei padri, quanto piuttosto la loro assenza, la loro latinanza. I padri sono talora così concentrati su se stessi e sul proprio lavoro e alle volte sulla propria realizzazione individuale da dimenticare anche la famiglia. Qualcuno di voi potrà dirmi, ma padre, oggi lei è stato troppo negativo, ha parlato soltanto dell'assenza dei padri, e cosa accade quando i padri non sono vicini ai figli. È vero, ho voluto sottolineare questo, perché mercoledì prossimo proseguirò questa catechesi mettendo alla luce la bellezza della paternità. Per questo ho scelto di cominciare dal buio per arrivare alla luce. Time for one of your viewer questions. This week, Nina BG sent us a question through Facebook. She asks, has a child of a diplomat or Swiss guard ever been born in the city-state? And if so, could they claim citizenship? Why can't any Catholic, by virtue of their baptism, get dual citizenship? How does that work? Well, Nina, that is a great question. First, the short answer, then the long answer. Swiss guards and a few lay people who work for specific Vatican agencies live inside Vatican City. There is no hospital in Vatican City, so any births would happen at a nearby Roman hospital. But certainly, children have been born while their parents live in Vatican City State. Those children can have Vatican citizenship for as long as their parents have citizenship. Here's what I mean. For example, a Swiss guard living in Vatican City is given a Vatican passport. His child is born while he's living and working inside the walls. That child is a Vatican citizen. When the Swiss guard's term of service is over and he leaves Vatican City for good, He automatically loses his Vatican citizenship, and so does his child. You also ask, why can't any baptized person get citizenship? Or can any baptized person get citizenship? And the answer is no. Why? Well, because being baptized, it does make you part of the church, but the church isn't a geographic place, and it's not a nation state. We often refer to the Vatican, 
when we really mean the hierarchy of the church, the people who collaborate with the Pope, and the organization that our Pope leads. Now, our baptism makes us part of that organization, but that organization is a moral authority, not a legal entity. When we talk about being a Vatican citizen, we're talking about being a citizen of Vatican city-state, which is a country and it is legally recognized by international law. And part of being a legal country, of course, means deciding who can and cannot get citizenship. Now, with such a small territory, Vatican City can't really support many citizens. I hope that answers your question. It's a bit of a complicated one. Send us your questions and we'll try to answer them right here. Vatican Connections is interactive. We answer your questions and explain things you want to know. You can reach us on Twitter at Vaticanections or by email at info at saltandlighttv.org. We'll try our best to answer your questions during this part of our show. Well, that's it for this week's Vatican Connections. We leave you with a clip from the general audience. Performers from an Italian circus entertained the Pope after his catechesis and even tried to get him in on the act. Tune in again next week for more of what's going on at the heart of the church. And don't forget you can follow us on Twitter or Facebook or check our blog for updates. And you can also watch us on demand on Roku TV. From everyone here, thanks for watching and see you next time. Thank you.